if you have to boil down a film that as much as we had to do it, the sad experience is that the first things that have to go is anything that's funny. Because that is never really that important that carries a story. A lot of the music had to go. And unfortunately, our, our narrator, we put all the weight of the film on the shoulders of the woman character of Claire, which I mean, didn't help her character in the show. Of it. I'm very happy that our narrator is reinstalled here because also Sam did it really very well. He hasn't seen it yet. Hmm. I'm right here. Why did you choose not to subtitle? I wish I could do it, but it's my only print, and uh, it could. And I have to really say thanks here to the protectionist because he worked for three days to make it possible. We shot the film on Super 35, which is really not a a format for distribution. It's a format. It's a native format to either blow it up to 70 millimeter or then make reduction prints, and they are very good quality. And as this is from the original negative, I could only strike one print. I could never make a reduction print. And actually, you cannot subtitle it Super 35 because it would not be centered. There would be over to the right and it would look off. And as this is my only print, I never got to subtitle it. The DVD will be subtitled, I promise. <laughs> but it didn't miss much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right here. That's why I put it into three parts. Yes, but, but I mean, releasing them at separate times. <laughs> yeah, it was, we had long debates, but basically between my editors and myself, because all the producers checked out. <laughs> they didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't kind of discuss this anymore. And at one point I had suggested it, but finally it seemed to make more sense to keep it in one. I don't know if they ever get it any form of commercial distribution for it, and maybe theoretically the theater could decide to play it in three evenings. I don't know. and the, I guess, where do you, I'm sorry, life and death, and I guess uh, the question, I guess, is where, how do you feel, where do you feel more comfortable in terms of the spectrum? Yeah. find that line and, 
actually I find it the most challenging thing to to sort of walk on that tightrope. And uh, it's because you can never really say what is really real. As soon as you're telling a story, there might be a very strong sense of reality in every scene. It might still be completely, the story might be complete fantasy. And the interesting about the thing about filmmaking is that you can tell a sheer fantasy with an enormous sense of reality. And actually, I do believe that the real documentaries made in the 20th century are fiction films. And I think the best documentary ever made by about, let's say, the city of San Francisco, in my book, is Vertigo by his book, which I don't think will feature in any documentary list. <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's difficult to tell that apart. Sometimes without a script, like I've done very many films without any script. And even in this film, there's lots of passages where we totally left any script behind and went into unknown territory. But still, if you sort of shoot from the guts and really have like, like flying without instruments, I think there's still a purpose to it. And especially once you edit it, you can decide what was your purpose. So I don't think in the end when a film is edited and finished that there's not, I don't think there's a single frame that I could not stand behind and would not know why it's there. We have no time for just uh, have two more questions. So can I hear? Yeah, but just I'm wondering about um, the feeling of the system. It really looks like a painting, like it's famous painting. Oh, yeah. uh, so I'm just wondering about, is it from the depths? Is it presenting something? Or? Oh, yeah, OK. Oh, okay. The question about the filming, the filming of the sister, which is made to look like a Vermeer painting. I guess the question about that is whether what your intention was. I mean, was that uh, sort of an instinctive choice on your part, or what you were trying to get across with that? That scene when William Hurst tries to recall his sister and can't do it, and then Claire is doing it for him. That scene in the script is the first time that the blind person, Edith, actually sees something. So I knew this was the first thing she was going to see. So it was very important for me what that would be, this first thing. It had to be 
something extraordinary and somehow something very archetypal. Now, you, there's a million ways to film a person in front of a camera talking to the camera, and mostly very banal. And, and really thinking what, what is, for me, the absolutely most stunning way that there is a person in a, in a frame, I could only say that must be a painting by Vermeer. And we didn't really um, copy any of Vermeer because we didn't want to take a specific one because they would have been sort of weird to copy one. So we made it generic Vermeer, so to speak. We basically, it is the color and the way the figure is framed and the light comes from a window because that's all his paintings of women are like this, that the light comes from the left side, there's a window, there's a wall behind, there's very soft colors, and diffused light. He's a, he, he was an extraordinary painter and he used uh, techniques as we know now that are very related to photography. Actually, he used some machines that were almost like early cameras. So Robbie and I, and this was something that we didn't have in the script. This was something that my cameraman and I sort of decided as we came to that scene. And Robbie took a very, 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 and he looked, he lit this for almost half a day, the simple shot. And I knew I had to just leave him in peace until he was back. And normally, if you shoot any scene, it's very hard to get the set quiet. Everybody, there's still somebody who has to work, and people are talking, and especially if you shot already for a month, it's very difficult to get anybody's concentration. In this scene, it was really <coughs> extremely mysterious. There was, everybody was whispering. I didn't tell anybody what was happening here. It was between Robbie and me. But sort of there was a feeling that something almost sacred was happening to this shot. And everybody was very concentrated, and extremely, extremely reverent to the painter that they had before. It was really good. And especially when we then transferred this shot to high definition and worked on it. You see it first when he shoots, when he shoots it, and then later you see it like as the computer translates it. And that's what I really like. That's when it looked more like a painting than we actually had it on film. Could you tell us about the, the, both the dream sequences and the sort of abstracted sequences? How those, I mean, both technically how those were created, but also just how you sort of how you came up with what you know what the images would be. Dreams. The dream sequences were the, technically the <coughs> biggest challenge of the film because how do you film a dream? Or how do you produce any dream images? And in preparation for Until the End of the World, I made a long research and sort of went through the entire history of filmmaking and try to find every dream sequence of the shot and use lots of friends who were knowledgeable and, and film historians and finally came up with like 50 scenes and we collected all the, all the, all the scenes and I looked at all the dream sequence, sequences and I was finally pretty disappointed because basically dreams looked like the film around them and was basically never different. It was always done with the possibilities of cinema. And it was disappointing. And so we realized we had to use a very different approach. And high definition was, and digital high definition was just about to happen. And, and I knew that there was 